Joining me now on the desk to chat about investment strategy and finding value on the JSE is Jeff Blount, the CEO of Canon Asset Managers. Thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us today. Morning. What a volatile few weeks we've had. And some say sit on your hands, do not participate because there's just too much risk and volatility at play. Others say that there's a lot of value to be had. And I mm. think that you're one of these uh, yeah. uh, people that say mm. that there is a lot of value. Take us through what we've seen over the past few couple of years since the recovery. We've seen value stocks, what you're saying is looking far cheaper and growth stocks looking more expensive. Tell us yeah, about that's the play a, that's a good summary. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think one of the, the policy responses that you saw after the global financial crisis was QE1, QE2, zero interest rate policies in the US. And what would normally have happened in that cycle, we think, is value stocks, very underpriced companies that have uh, tangible net asset value uh, assets to back them, for example, low PE, high dividend yield yeah. stocks, typically would have done well over this market phase as the market markets recover off from the financial crisis. But what we saw with the, those policy responses is this, if you want to call it this liquidity supernova. And we think what occurred was that your uh, cost of capital got distorted uh, in, in, in the US in particular. And so people, instead of taking the money from QE1 and QE2 and buying houses and stimulating the economy, went and speculated. Yeah. And where did they speculate? They went and speculated in China and in India, in property, in equities. They speculated in what we believe is global sovereign debt. We think there's a global sovereign bubble. So, so government bonds became very expensive. Mm. Uh, and South Africa also uh, was a recipient of these speculative flows. So uh, expensive, growthy stocks, companies that had good stories rather than, and often very good quality companies, um, but they just got increasingly, increasingly expensive. So in the last few years, we saw expensive parts of the market get more expensive and cheap value areas of the market just bounced along the bottom. Um, uh, and so it's been a growth cycle. It doesn't feel like a growth cycle. Growth is normally euphoric and uh, bullish and when, you know, buoyant times, but uh, it's definitely been a growth market. Well, what's also quite fascinating, you said that there's uh, certain bubbles that have mm. been occurring because of the, of the stimulus. We've mm. seen this kind of stimulus before in after, after the, the dot-com crisis. Mm. We saw it after 9-11, mm. especially when we saw um, the market needing a little bit of, of stimulus as well. Uh, you're talking about the cost of capital, and mm. this is why we're starting to see the inflow into South Africa. Mm. Do you think that we could be, in certain instances of the JSE, in bubble territory? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so tell us, uh, tell us exactly where we are in bubble territory when it comes to um, Well, in fact, I suppose the broad themes would be uh, norm your larger companies, because that's what foreigners would chase, because they've got the liquidity. Companies with China exposure, NASPAS is a classic case. Mm. We think that uh, NASPAS is a brilliant business, but uh, because it's got China exposure, it's participating in this bubble. Uh, store, stocks that have exposure to Africa, the Africa growth story. And again, we buy the China growth story, we buy the African growth story, but the prices that you're paying for, for example, ShopRite are just too high. So these are great businesses, but you know, they say, how do you turn a great business into a bad investment? You overpay for it. So it's these types of themes, things, things are stories. In other words, people are pinning their hopes on future growth prospects rather than valuation underpins. Mm. And these are the parts of the market that have become increasingly expensive. But truly, I mean, if you buy into the NASPERS and mm. the ShopRite story and you buy into Africa and China, mm. we should be seeing stable growth and at least very close to 10%, so between, say, 8 mm. and 10% going forward. Then surely earnings are going to start reflecting the growth and therefore the share price should actually go up. I'm playing devil's yeah, advocate absolutely. here. <laughs> uh, it's in the price. Uh, you know, it's in the so price. So all of this has more. been priced yeah, in, essentially. Yeah. In fact, what you, but I think what you risk is when these growth targets are not met or when earnings targets for these businesses are not met. Uh, you know, MassMod came out last week with a disappointing result. Um, and uh, I think these are the types of things that when the expectations are not met, these shares get punished. I mean, you know, I mean, overall, you know, we, we, we are concerned about global growth and the global uh, economy and the impact that it has on, on corporate earnings. We just think that in certain segments of the market, people have overpaid uh, and are continuing to overpay for these yeah. shares. Let's touch on where you are seeing value. And I know that one of the metrics you actually use, you mm. rather use the cyclically adjusted price earnings mm. ratios uh, as opposed to just looking mm. at the, the normal PE mm. metric. Tell us about what, what you've actually come up with, okay. where you're seeing value. V very briefly, the cyclically adjusted PE is where you take the last seven years of earnings mm. and you average it out and you adjust it for inflation. One year trailing PEs are good, but they can be perverted. You can have an example where you have very high earnings and a buoyant price, and so you have a high P over high E giving you 
a, a, a fair value indicator, but in fact the market is expensive or the stock is expensive. And so we look across the market, we use the seven year number because the E, the earnings component is more stable. So you get a variable P over a more stable E, and that's a much better value indicator. Um, and so for example, the, the shares, a, a good example is NASPAS. NASPAS is on a 20 yeah. trailing PE, yet on a cyclically adjusted PE it's on 60. Now we do factor in the fact that there is growth coming out of NOSPAS and high growth coming in there, but does the growth warrant a, a, a 60 PE? Um, Anglos and Billiton are, are good cases in point. Um, Anglos on a, a cyclically adjusted PE uh, is just above 10, Billiton is just above uh, uh, around 10 as well. But on the cyclically adjusted one, Billiton's on 20, Anglos on 10. Billiton is twice as expensive as Anglos. Now you could argue that that warrants a quality premium, but double, we're not so sure. Well, let's, I mean, this is quite fascinating, the Anglo-American BHP Billiton mm. debate that has been raging. Mm. One of the reasons they say that Anglo-American is looking quite cheap, there, there are a mm. lot of concerns about nationalization here. Mm. Why, do you think, why do you think investors have actually been selling out of the Anglo-American story and opting for the likes of BHP? When you look at you know, the top-down approach, I know you're looking mm. at it from a bottom-up mm. perspective, but top-down, there's also other factors that are playing out with a lot of the stocks that you've mentioned. Um, yeah, look, I think that in, in this case, in specific cases, uh, people like the commodity basket that BHP Billiton represents. Historically, BHP Billiton has had better management. You know, they get their projects done ahead of time, ahead of schedule, below cost. Uh, Anglos has tended to get projects done, uh, you know, over cost and late. But uh, we think Cynthia Carroll, for example, is doing a good job in actually cleaning up the business, reducing yeah. the, the cost structures in the business, and that's not recognised. Yeah, I, I, again, we do acknowledge that probably on a, on a, a quality basis, Billiton does deserve a premium. Yeah. But if you look at seven-year numbers, seven-year earnings numbers, uh, and you look at the through the cycle price valuation, uh, we don't think it warrants double the price. Okay, so what about value traps? We know That's that some, the, yeah. <laughs> some say that stocks mm. are very cheap for a reason. I know that one of your preferred players, the likes of Grinrod, I also know that you are very mm. much involved in the construction industry. Mm. You're finding a lot of value there, and these numbers mm. are just becoming more and more dire. Mm. Uh, tell us about the play there where you ensure that you don't fall into a value trap, but you're buying value and you will see returns down the line. Mm. Uh, you know, the typical, st uh, I, I suppose the, the, the theme that you get in terms of what we're looking at is we typically get in too early and perhaps we sell too early. You want to buy shares when there's, well, you can't time it perfectly, but normally when we're buying is when there's maximum bad news in the marketplace, and which is right now, for example, in construction, uh, pretty much that represents the industry. Um, the way you're trying to avoid a value trap is to ensure that the quality of the businesses that you're looking at uh, are sustainable. In other words, here's a quality business that is mispriced at the moment. Market sentiment's fallen out of love with it. So for example, Group 5 is a case in point where you know, through the cycle, we think this is a very high quality construction business. Right now it's priced, uh, it's, it's, it's priced almost for bankruptcy, which is definitely not the case. So you're looking for the mispriced quality. I think that's the way you try and avoid the value traps is to try and focus yeah. on the quality of the business. Not, don't buy cheap, a lot of cheap shares deserve to be cheap buy quality shares that look like they're temporarily mispriced and then you've got to be patient. Absolutely. Yeah. Jeff, are you shaken by the volatility in the market at all and do you think that there could be more quantitative easing? What is your, your overall yeah. macro look? Because I'm sure you, you need to have an overall view of what is going to occur mm. on a global level. I think, yeah, the, the, uh, well, we, we don't believe that there's going to be QE3. Um, we think it would be, in, uh, be inappropriate. Uh, the issue is that you, quantitative easing one and two really came when liquidity in the market dried up. For example, the banks, the interbank markets dried up. The banks weren't lending to each other. Uh, right now, there's no liquidity crisis, but there is a solvency problem. In other words, uh, governments are, are looking bankrupt, um, <coughs> and or many governments are looking bankrupt, and uh, many banks are looking like they're in trouble. But this is not liquidity. A solvency problem is actually whether they can pay back their debts. Uh, we think essentially printing money, which QE3 would be, doesn't solve that problem. Yeah. Fantastic, Jeff. Yeah. We have to leave it there. Great to have you cool. on the desk. Much Thanks. appreciated. Jeff Blount, the CEO of Canon Asset Management.